This program is brought to you by Grand Valley State University. Just from my own vantage point, I, I must say at the outset, I'm a, I'm a business person. So I came to the university, and that has been now six years ago, but I need you to take it back just a little bit longer. I am not a Grand Rapidian, uh, but I call it home here now. Um, I'd never been to Grand Rapids before until 1989, and I came here to help run a family-owned business. And I turned the business back over to the family, and I was Haviland Enterprises here in Grand Rapids. And somebody asked me the question, what were we about to go through? And I quickly said something we hadn't seen before. And that was quite a number of years ago now, and I sort of reflect back on that. One of the questions was that I was presented, and Christina's comments this morning uh, certainly brought it home to me again, is business models. And everybody had seen a business model here that said, well, sometimes you get a little wet. Uh, water creeps maybe up to your ankles. Uh, every once in a while you water to your knees, but fret not. Water will recede. So the question is, what have we gone or we're about to go through, and what have we gone through? And I'll give you a personal definition that our students have said is, we've gone through Hurricane Katrina North. And my journey into this space is, um, I know I was pleasantly given this title of guru. We, I should share with you, there are no gurus of sustainability. I, I'm pleased that maybe uh, we've learned something along the way, but I'm a team player, and I'm learning from everybody in this space. And we've got a lot to learn, as Christina and the mayor and our president have shared with us. So this is a total team effort. So I came here to the university with the invitation of John Jacobois, <laughs> who was a business owner here and my mentoring coach at the time. And my first introduction to Grand Valley was with Tim Shedd and with Dean Williams. <laughs> and that was when our president, Mark Murray, we all sat down and said, what does sustainability really mean? Well, that first meeting was an hour and a half <laughs> in the Peninsula Club. And we said, let's have another conversation. So that's how my introduction to Grand Valley started. But I, I see the mayor out there, and he said one of the most important things is personal friendship. Well, I have to share a personal story. I didn't know much about sustainability. I really still don't. But I'm pressed by students in the team here at Grand Valley to learn more every day. So when this little period of time came of what works, I was a balanced scorecard manager, so I had looked at those principles of how you run a business with your employees and with your operations and in the community, so I was metric driven, so I was okay. But I knew there was another level we could all go to. So I, somebody had said, well, why don't you take a little time off and go learn? So I spent about a year, lots of morning cups of coffee down in the basement. But it was the Freds, your dad of the world, mayors, press you on, right? Keep going. So I had those, and I found out way back when that there were sustainable cities. There were sustainable universities. There were sustainable businesses. I had never seen a set of principles that applied to everybody in my life. Because I think we heard the comments this morning. We do now, but back then it's like, well, business. They make money, cash, profit. Government, well, they run things. And education, they're, they're, they're different. They're out there with students. Well, when I saw all these three, I said, wait a minute, there's an opportunity for a bringing all three of those together. So that's a journey that I've been on. But the, with the mayor, I remember very well looking at you out there and saying, there was a Sustainable Cities Conference that had Ken Portney and a few others. And I said, somebody ought to go to that. <laughs> and... You said, well, we don't have budgets to go like that. You remember that? So, I didn't have a job at the time, but you said, you go. So I did it. So I took a card, put Norman Christopher, City of Grand Rapids. I paid for half, he personally paid for half. That's how that journey started with the city. So it's about personal relationships. So um, for me, this journey goes through about five phases. And the first one is how you create awareness. And we'll let the rest of this group talk to you about how you do that. 
The second thing is this understanding of what does sustainability really mean. And I saw the definitions that were up there. It is Chief Seattle because our students, way back when, developed this little guy. And they chose that definition is we do not inherit the earth from our fathers, we borrow it from our children. The mayor reminds us we're in our seventh generation today. And I still use your quote, what will our seventh generation say about us? So that was understanding. And it means something different. It means something different to the Brooks College of Interdisciplinary Studies. It means something different to Seedman, where I spend a fair amount of my time as well. So for us, the journey was a very interdisciplinary one. And I remember the charter coming back. Is if sustainability works, it has to be to everybody, which means all students, not just business. So that's a journey. Then you get to where to apply it. And I think you've heard some of the markers up there. And I'm, we'll pass this down and give perspectives about what we've done in administration and on campus and with our students. We now have seen some progress. And our progress has been, I think, reassuring that we're on the right journey and the right path. But now people aren't necessarily interested in just progress. What do we want to see? transformational change. So the change now reflects in leadership. So now the new question is, who are the leaders of tomorrow in sustainable development? It's the Christinas of the world. Next generation. So we gotta equip them with the best possible toolbox that we can. Because I know personally I make some good decisions along the way but uh, I'm learning how to make better ones. So that's the framework that we're in. Uh, the journey for me has just been great. Um, it encourages me every day. So I live today in the college, now known as the Brooks College, and my dean is Dean Hunter. Thank you. I feel like I should stand up, would that help? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can sort of see you, but I'll just take this. Maybe I'll take this. Okay. Because um, I, I can see you going like this. <laughs> That's hard. Um, to my surprise, in 2004, they decided to move the sustainability initiative into the College of Interdisciplinary Studies. And I knew something about it, but not a lot about it. Um, but we jumped in, and uh, with Norman leading us, we've really uh, made a lot of progress, I think, in encouraging the university to go forward. The College of Interdisciplinary Studies is um, a university-wide kind of college. We support university-wide initiatives. And um, we also have some of our own programs. We, we have an environmental studies program, but it's not, although it's housed in the, in the college, it is not owned by the college. So it, the faculty that teach in it are interdisciplinary. They come from, most come from um, Jan's uh, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And that, that's the way we do our programs. We invite faculty from around the university with different disciplines to come together and, and work interdisciplinarily. So um, that's where we are. And Norman set a standard for us uh, in terms of dealing with other people in the university is we start with the question, how can we add value to what you're doing? Uh, we had a faculty member who was extremely interested in green chemistry. She's been working, Jim may be talking about this, but I just, and so we asked, she, we said, does she want some help? And we said, how can we add value? And um, she's now developed a green uh, chemistry certificate. So that's kind of how we, how we work in our college. We, um, so we were charged with taking on the sustain sustainability for the university in the sense of finding the pathways to help people do sustainability, moving through whatever problems we had, engaging the university in a becoming a more sustainable university. And our president, Thomas Haas, signed two agreements for us, the, camp, uh, the um, Campus Climate Commitment, which commits Grand Valley to becoming carbon neutral and, and making other climate change uh, steps, and also the Talwar Tal Declaration, which commits us to providing sustainable education to our students and to the community. So. Those commitments by the president also led us towards um, the path that we've taken. And we've tried to do things in four different areas. We are trying to create uh, top-notch, high-quality education for our students in sustainable principles um, in all of the different disciplines. And that's been picked up by our colleges who, you 
you know, work with work with it in their in their in their disciplines. Um, and we're trying to provide opportunities for our faculty and staff as well to become educated in sustainable practice and and work on the pro projects that we can within the university to make the whole university operation more sustainable. We would really like to be like more like Steelcase and more like Herman Miller. And we've got um, big projects in our dining in terms of um, composting. We're, we're moving some of our compost that they've created to our community garden. Everything is kind of inter, inter, interrelated in our college. Um, and I, we started the trayless revolution at Grand Valley where we took away the trays and saved a thousand, thousand gallons of water and a thousand pounds of food a day in terms of our waste. So we're promoting that all across the university, every step we can make. But most of the ideas come from the students or the people in the other departments that say, we'd like to try this. Can you support us in this? Can you help us? And uh, what are the best practices? And, uh, and Norman, that's one of Norman's jobs is to continuously find out what are the best practices. And it's a rapidly changing best practice situation out there. So we're trying to keep up with that so we can provide that. So one part is just educating our students in our community. Another part is um, is responding to the student involvement in in, in interdisciplinary studies in in a, in a way that provides them with coursework, but also provides them with opportunities to act on campus. And Emily will talk a little bit more about that, I think. Um, but we now have over 200 courses that have sustainable content. Probably more. We counted up a year or so ago, and we probably have a lot more. And we have uh, courses and programs that are specifically designed for uh, sustainability education for our students. We're also uh, working with graduate students to database green jobs so that we can help the community and our, our students know what the green jobs are that are out there that are coming and what, what, what the future looks like in that area so we can train people and prepare them for those. And the students have really been pushing us to to continue to look at all kinds of issues, and we're really grateful for them for that. And then the other part is our community engagement. We, as a college, we have a deep commitment to community engagement, and to have our students have uh, really uh, interactive kind of experiences in the community where they can learn hands-on, and they can contribute to the community. Um, I don't know, if, I wasn't here for the President Haas part, but about 88% of our students or more stay in the community in West Michigan, and so we want those students to be prepared and be, be uh, adding to the sustainability initiatives that the region is taking. So we've taken a broad regional view of sustainability um, and we are there to help anybody who, who wants to step forward and say we'd like, to, we'd like to have some information about sustainability. These are the things we're thinking. Can you direct us? Can you connect us? Can you lead us in the, in the appropriate way? So that, those are kind of our areas, the facilities, the education, student involvement, and the community engagement that we're working on. And we try to take the ideas and push them out. I just, I just want to give one quick example. Um, we, we started an environmental studies major, which uh, caught on fast, and we have a rapid, it's rapidly growing. So, a minor, sorry, minor. So that's rapidly growing. That connected to our community garden that people are work, that people and the students and uh, staff are working on in the, in our property, our empty property out there. Um, and we've been developing that community garden. That's led to an interest in sustainable agriculture. We've discovered we have a faculty member, Edwin Joseph, who has expertise in sustainable, and other two other faculty members too, that have expertise. Hmm? Yeah, he's right there. <laughs> um, who have expertise in sustainable agriculture. And we have a student interest in that. So that's leading to uh, courses and perhaps a certificate in sustainable agriculture. We have um, now we're gonna we're hoping to have a hoop house that we could grow food and uh, other things in forty eight months of the year forty twelve months. Oh, so it's gonna be twelve. Uh, I mean forty eight weeks, but it's twelve months. It's gonna be twelve months of the year we can use this hoop house, um, which is sustainable in and of itself, and um, we're hoping to sell produce to our our uh, food services through a vendor. And um, and gr we're growing. All these things are kind of tumbling together as we as we grow. What new idea leads to another new idea leads to another idea. So we're very excited about that new progress that we're making right now. Um, so 
that's that's what our the role of our colleges. We're also um, involved with the city. We've been helping them with their sustainability efforts. We committed uh, to a contract with them this year to really help them look at every aspect of their operations and see if we can help guide it towards more sustainability. And we're and they're making huge progress on that. They have a very enviable sustainability um, uh, plan <laughs> that, is, that has specific goals and, and it's very enviable for us. We'd like to have even more specific goals in terms of Grand Valley in relationship to what we're doing. So that's kind of where the College of Interdisciplinary is and the work that we're doing. Guided by Norman and many and many other colleagues <coughs> across the university. So all that she had. Yeah, I think you can't I've continued to try and stand it. And I'm Jan Joseph, and I'm one of the associate deans in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. <clears throat> and I would present, present a little bit of background um, for those of you who are not familiar with our college. Just to let you know that um, we take sustainability very seriously because we recognize as being the largest college in the institution, um, having a bulk of the faculty, almost 60% of the faculty, dealing with so many of the students that um, embracing sustainability has to be something that we take very seriously because if we don't, we could, um, I would say, um, you know, weaken the efforts of all the people that we try to collaborate with. So I'm going to present it from a few different perspectives, what we do with administrative um, uh, work in the college, how we approach curriculum and support curriculum, and how we look at uh, outreach and service, again, with some examples for each of those. Um, we start off um, our sustainability initiatives by looking at our strategic plans. Specifically, um, we have a spe special section, again, following the university's um, strategic planning. And we ask ourselves, what action items um, can we include here? What are, our, what are our outcomes? How can we approach sustainability in a very strategic way? Uh, this morning I'm listening to people with it, having great metrics and stuff and I'm thinking, oh, we need to start getting some baseline data and then begin to say, okay, here's how much paper we saved and here's how we did this. And we are not there yet, but certainly we're doing some very um, important work um, that I can explain to you um, through a broader perspective of, say, curriculum and academics. Wendy has already talked about this and when we look at curriculum, and we look at what our faculty are doing, we recognize that we have excellent faculty, some already mentioned here, who are very interested and have experience in the areas of sustainability. So we are always looking for ways that we could collaborate with the College of, the Brooks College of Interdisciplinary Studies. We always look for ways to collaborate with them. We share a lot of faculty expertise with them. Many of our faculty have joint appointments with uh, our sister college in this interdisciplinary studies. And for many of them, it centers around sustainability. So the green certificate, the green, green chemistry course, um, these are things that were joint initiatives between our faculty and um, and Brooks Cois, we call it Brooks Cois for short. Mm -hmm. um, so we have looked at, last year we, we, we realized, wow, they were given sustainability awards and we recognized, wow, a lot of our faculty got sustainability awards. So we made a note of that. Ooh, this is wonderful. We had several <laughs> of them getting awards. Um, again, we, our faculty are involved in ecotourism. They work with other colleges as well. They work with uh, hospitality and tourism. They work with the School of Business on initiatives in places like Nicaragua. Um, we have had students working on various mm -hmm. videos and recycling, things that would be not just for their work in, say, the School of Calm, but also what they would be able to present as part of the outreach um, from our college to the broader Grand Rapids community. And um, I really want to emphasize, emphasize how important that um, green chemistry certificate is to us because we realize that we are going to have to make sure that our new st our students, our leaders of tomorrow, really are looking and being very careful and being responsible how we use the Earth's resources. So that green, chem green chemistry certificate is really important to us uh, as well, and we really want to move that forward in the coming years. 
Um, our administrative uh, work, I'll give you an example today of something, because I'm going to use this to let you know that when I leave early, it's not because I don't want to be here. But we have a meeting that starts at 11 o'clock that I have to start the meeting. So I have to be there by 10.45, so I have to leave. But one of the things, I'll give you an example. We are invited to that, to that meeting. Um, we already invited, sorry, um, about 900 people. And in the past, we would send flyers twice to remind them. Um, now we have it on our website to get an email. We have found a way to work through a step process. We have a mailing list for unit heads, and then we ask them to send it to their groups. So we have set up special mailing lists that would connect to all our faculty and our staff at all levels so that we are able to send out notices. So when you think about that, you could just see three reams of paper and all the ink already saved there. And if you kind of see the magnitude of the correspondence that we have in such a large college, as we have moved more and more to doing most things online and electronically, we have seen a tremendous difference um, in the amount of paper we use. As I said, I wish we were taking the before and after data so we could say we save you know, X amount of sheets of paper, how much amount of ink have to go back and have us start taking some of that data now, a new baseline beginning this year. But um, our faculty governance, we have moved a, a lot of things online. Our faculty are developing the next 2016 um, and beyond strategic planning. And we have gone to things like Google Docs, and people probably, the young people are going Google Docs, we know what that is, and the 61-year-olds are going yeah. <laughs> So the question is, how can we use these online systems to share and to find a way to get the same work done without having reams and reams of paper printed every time? And we have been very successful. Our faculty submit all their activity reports online, and we know how faculty could talk about themselves. So just imagine about 500 plus people telling you 20 pages about themselves every year, do some math there, and you see how much paper we have been sending. So we, I think we have been very good at paper. We've been looking at um, people's workloads and how we could do flexible time so that people could drive in at different times to avoid traffic jams and all that. Very simple things we have been trying to do with our staff. Um, uh, black, okay, we actually had a really fun thing. We moved um, our college office and several of our units a couple of years ago into a LEED certified building. Um, that's the new MAC extension. And I personally was really deeply involved in the design phase of that building and I really enjoyed that process. And as we were doing, making that change, we thought about what can we do to get people to move because we had faculty complaining about, well, we're only going to have one wall of bookshelves, and I have six walls of bookshelves now. And, you know, and we said, OK, let's look at what you need to keep, and what do you need to recycle, and what do you need to share. And we actually had people review their offices carefully. We worked with the units that were moving the, the actual whole office, <coughs> department offices. And we had something we call a shred fest, and a re recycling, and a share fest. And what we had is everybody, we opened a room one day, and if you had X amount of binders, and you'd be surprised to see how much extra office supplies people have because of how they used to do their work. And then this other department is now doing their work in a different way, and they need it. So we put it all into one room, and it was like, come and take what you need. And we cut down so much on costs and buying lots of materials and supplies that year, and also reduce our little footprint of paper. Um, our outreach, just to finish up quickly, we have lots of work going on with people who, um, like in anthropology, um, looking at some of the heritage work um, in West Michigan. We have a really great project I want to mention, the Sparkle Project, where we have some a faculty member who has found a way to work with K-12 students to show how they could ride their bicycles and watch TV at the same time, or even to sit on balls, so, yeah, big balls, so that they can get posture improve. Um, so we've had some really good initiatives that we could talk about next time you meet me, because we don't have enough time to talk about it all. But most importantly, I want to say that it goes back to our strategic planning. It goes back to us saying that this is important, connecting the lines from the strategic plans to the outcomes to the people. 
And the next big thing that we have found is that the more we collaborate across our colleges, the more we are able to make this effort meaningful and to make it part of our culture. So when I slip out, just know it's not about you. I have to be <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. My name is George Grant Jr. and you have to tell me about this Google thing. <laughs> well, I don't even know why it's docking, so you'll have to explain that to me. Uh, I'm the dean of the College of Community and Public Service, and it's made up of criminal justice, police academy, social work, hospitality, tourism management, school of public, nonprofit health administration, and the Johnson Center for Philanthropy. So. A little bit all over the place, and one of the, and it's an academic college, so our primary focus is teaching, and then followed by scholarship and service. And our focus in talking about sustainability has been the, around the ideas of, of environment, social, and economic, but the focus on what's happening in the community, and the focus on <coughs> nonprofits, and especially poor families, low-income families, and what are some of the things that we can do to work with those families. If you're a nonprofit, one of the, the challenges that you have is trying to do more work because the, the need is out there with less resources. And with these fewer resources, then you have this discussion about sustainability. So if you're someone on the, on the board or you're the board of directors, one of your questions the, with all of the things that I have to do, adding sustainability, is that going to be more work? Why is that a priority? Why do I need to do something like that? And that what we're trying to do in our college and what our faculty, our faculty is trying to do is working with different uh, organizations to address that issue of how it can have a positive impact. One of the examples is that uh, we have faculty working with a number of food pantries. And they did this huge study looking at resources and how food is packaged and transportation and getting uh, uh, the need, getting the food out to people who, who need it. And in this study, and, doing the, and then working with these food pantries, what they were able to do was come up with a way of looking at a distribution system so that food could move faster, that the bulk products that they had, that they would package it differently, that they would have ways of getting the resources to people, ways of getting the food from the farmers into the city and so you could address the issue of nutrition, you could address the issue of transportation, and so if, if people are healthier, then you can reduce some of the health care costs. If, if people are eating the, the, the right foods, you reduce some of the, the junk food kinds of things that people are getting, and you increase the, the farmer's yield because of the kinds of things that they're producing. So by doing something as, as, as simple as a, 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 uh, a complicated study that they had to do, but by doing this study that they were able to help with the restructuring, and then with the restructuring that a number of these food pantries were able to go after federal funding and got federal funding to provide additional resources and support. So this idea of sustainability, it's working with people in the community, a partnership, trying to create ways to sustain, in, in this case in Grand Rapids, because this was the, the focus was uh, mostly in Grand Rapids, but Kent County as well. And we know some of the, the, the low income areas in Grand Rapids and some of the, the struggles that people are having. So by providing this way of providing resources that you now have children who are, are eating and because they're eating, hopefully, they can do better in school. And if they can do better in school, they can concentrate. They can then address this issue of what's the next generation going to be like. And so that's just one of the examples. There, there are others, and if, if their questions come up, I'll talk more about that. But I just wanted to give you a brief overview of, of the college and a few things that we're trying to do there. Thank you. Um, as Norma said, I'm Emily and I'm the grad assistant with the Sustainability Initiative. Um, and I just want to talk briefly about a new project that we've started called the Student Sustainability Partnership. And we just started that this semester. And the idea is it's a group that's going to bring together student leaders from different student organizations that are doing sustainability work and other interested students 
to collaborate on the sustainability projects. And the name kind of comes from the Community Sustainability Partnership, which Mayor Hartwell talked about. And it's a similar concept with student groups on campus. Because there's a lot of great sustainability work going on on campus from the student side, but it's pretty dispersed. And there's one, you know, one student group will be hosting an event, and another group will be hosting some other event, and those groups won't know about the other's events, and they, there really has been a lack of communication. And I, this group is set up to kind of bring them together so that communication can happen, and that people can share resources. And so that also, our department um, can be more informed about what's going on, because I've only been uh, with the department for, you know, starting last semester, so I'm still amazed by how, how many times I had learned about something going on that I had no idea. And, you know, I, you would think I'd be a little more informed about everything that's going on considering where I work, but there's too much, so, which is a good thing, and I think it's good that at Grand Valley the efforts are so grassroots, but I think through this uh, partnership we're gonna be able to accomplish even more by working together and sharing resources. So uh, the structure is the group is going to meet a few times each semester, and then we also have a discussion board online forum set up so that a uh, conversation can continue throughout. So if, if a student group is hosting an event or they have something coming up, they can post it on there and say, is, you know, is anyone else interested in uh, coming to the event or let your group know about it or we need volunteers or we need people to do this, and then they can make those events even more successful. And the background about this is that uh, we were having conversations with the Student Environmental Coalition and the Student Senate, and they both expressed a desire because they kind of felt the same thing, that they were working on these issues but felt pretty isolated from other people that were working on it. And then also in the past, uh, the Sustainability Initiative hosted roundtables, which was the same sort of thing, bringing together student leaders to talk about sustainability on campus. But the event would just occur one time, there wasn't much follow-up. And so this is kind of taking it to the next level. So there will be follow-up in a way for the projects and ideas that come up to actually be implemented. Um, the uh, other reason we have been starting this is that from my experience since I started here, I would go to different events at Grand Valley, have a table about our sustainability initiative, and students would come up and they'd be really excited about uh, Grand Valley having a sustainability initiative on campus and they'd say this is great how can I get involved and there was never really one distinct answer we could give them it was more what's your interest area we can help you find an internship we can direct you to this student group but now we kind of have one way that we can say you want to know more about our department and more about what we do you can become involved in this partnership and it's also going to be able to give us a let us keep a better uh, feel for what are sustainability priorities for students and what is it that students want to see happening. Um, so we'll be better informed and we'll have this base of students as a resource to us. And I just, we've only met one time so far. This is a totally new project. So, but some of, from the first meeting, it was pretty clear that there's definitely a need for this. Um, one of the things that came up, there was a student who is part of a group that kind of dwindled in numbers, but they have this funding to bring in a speaker on sustainability. And if they don't use it by the end of the semester, you know, they lose their funding. So it seems a shame not to use it and bring in a sustainability speaker. And so because his group has dwindled, he wasn't going to be able to do this necessarily, but then he brought this to the group, and now the group is going to try and get a speaker before, together before the end of the year in a panel. Um, so that's just one really concrete example of how sustainability is going to be promoted through this group. And then some of the other things that the group has talked about is having a kind of a PR campaign on Grand Valley about what is sustainability. Um, because I, I, the students were saying that they feel there's still quite a bit of misunderstanding about what sustainability really is. And there's a lot of buzzwords out there and what do they all mean. And, um, through maybe having a set event each semester that talks about what is sustainability and what are those buzzwords and what do they really mean. Hopefully we can you know, penetrate a little deeper into the student body with an um, understanding of sustainability. Um, and so I guess just a plug, our next meeting is going to be Monday, April 19th. So any students in the audience, if you want to be involved, um, just let me know. And 
you can check out our website that has more information. It has the link to our, our discussion board, um, which you can join. And then I just want to finish by talking briefly about Campus Sustainability Week, which is in October, um, the last week of October. And this is, uh, we've been having this for several years now. Um, and it's just a focus week on campus that talks about sustainability and tries to have a lot of events so that students have more chance to learn about sustainability and how they can be involved at Grand Valley. And this year we're going to be hosting a TEDx event, um, which for those of you who don't know what TED is, it's uh, a one-day conference and it's going to have speakers who speak for 18 minutes or less about a project they're doing, they tell their story, um, and then there's time in between to network with other people and learn more about their ideas. Um, so right now we're looking for people to submit abstracts to speak there. So if you are interested in that as well, you can go to gbsu.edu slash TEDx and find out more. So thanks. Salma Tucker. Uh, I currently work for the City of Grand Rapids. I got my undergrad at Grand Valley. I'm currently in the master's program in the College of Community and Public Service and Public Administration. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess you could say that Emily and I are the product of some of the folks that you see in the city right here. So um, I work I'm, I work full time for the City of Grand Rapids, but I'm a part time master's student. And uh, all the stuff that we've talked about today sustainability and you know making sure that making sure that we, that we include the triple bottom line in the work that we do I include that same work those same philosophies those same ideas in the work that I currently do so um, you're seeing some of you're seeing some of the, the labor that you folks are doing and, and coming to fruition which is very very cool I guess I'll start briefly with um, when I was first introduced to sustainability Emily talked about a week that they have called sustainability week where they bring together, they bring in all kinds of speakers about sustainability and they try to raise awareness about it. Well, when I came my freshman year to Grand Valley in 2005, at that time, I think they had just closed or they were opening, um, they, were, they had just closed the project for uh, Lake Ontario Hall, which was Grand Valley's, I believe, first, uh, first LEED certified building. And so that, that particular year was, was really interesting because there was all this hubbub about sustainability. and. To me, walking as a freshman on campus in 2005, seeing the flyers on my way to class that said sustainability week, you know, come out and see these speakers, it's from this day to this day. I said, well, I have no idea what sustainability is. Um, maybe that's just something, you know, esoteric, something professors do, something that the PhDs, I, don't, I have no idea what that is. So <laughs> we sat down with our friends and we thought, well, what the heck is sustainability? And, um, and, through, and through that week of awareness, we, we were able to learn. And, Later on in my academic career, I became more intimately involved with what sustainability is. Who knew that um, at the end of my academic career with Grand Valley, um, for my undergrad, I would be working um, on the city's uh, energy efficiency and conservation block grant. Um, I was instrumental in uh, securing the funds for our, for our, for our first uh, infusion of cash from the federal government to do um, energy efficiency and energy conservation projects. Um, we were able to get that off the ground. I believe those funds have been um, what they call obligated. Um, and so we're, we'll be receiving those funds. And, and that's, that's very exciting because as we learned from, from uh, Christina Keller at, the, at Cascade Engineering, that a lot of these projects cost, they cost money. They take some capital. They take some startup capital. So the city of Grand Rapids is able to use some of that money and, um, and start some of these projects that, that the mayor talks about, like the 20% 20 20 by 2008 and 100% by 2020. So that's very exciting, and, um, and projecting from that, once I finished my work um, in my internship in the Office of Energy and Sustainability and um, in the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grant, I now work in the city's Information Technology Department, which is kind of a strange place for someone who got their undergrad in political science and public administration. Um, but what I've found is, um, and, and, in, and in information technology, I suppose I should tell you this, in information technology, there's also a, a new a new branch called change management. And when when my boss hired me, um, he knew that there would be a need for change management in the city. They're going through a, a very very tumultuous budgetary time. Um, and what do we know about what do we know about budgets? Um, and what do we know when we have to cut? Well, we have to do things differently. We still have a product. We still have services to provide, but we have less resources to do that with. And um, a, principal part of the work that I do in information technology is getting folks to sort of do their job differently, try to understand 
what they do and use the technology that we offer, um, new technology that we offer to hopefully do it faster, do it more efficiently, do it in a different way, think about it, conceptualize it in a different way. And I've been trying to get Mayor Hartwell to tweet for some time now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> haven't quite gotten there, but... Good <laughs> luck with this. <laughs> Keep so we know that just like Mayor Hartwell, he, he has a message to get out, and there are lots of different ways that he can get that message out. And one of those ways, I think that you know he should consider tweeting. So, <laughs> so we're, we're going to try and get um, the, the same way that we try to get Mayor Hartwell to do this. We try to get the, uh, the whole the whole the whole city staff to think about their job in a different way and leverage some of this technology to affect the change that we need in the organization. And I was really impressed after listening to uh, after listening to Christina's conversation um, about how proactive Cascade Engineering is. Well, I think the idea is with change management and an information technology because you you think change management is kind of a, an intro, it's kind of a strange place for change management to be, but um, it's all about behavior and it's about organizational development. It's about creating a culture that thinks sustainably. And I remember working on the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grant during my internship and calling around to lots of different cities of places that we consider leaders in sustainability or, 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 or you know, sort of the green idea. Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, even Chicago to a lot of respects. And when I had a really interesting conversation with Portland, I said, well, yeah, I said, well how did you get here? How did you get to the place where you, know, you became, you become sort of this, this, you know, this, this leader in, in, this, in this ideology? And they said, well, it's funny because 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, we started down this path and we did the same way most governments do things, but it took a very, very long time to start habits to, to let people know that this is just how we do business. We buy Energy Star, we buy Energy Star appliances, we buy things or we do things that don't, that don't consume paper or you know, we create this environment where people understand that this is the norm. And so I think that we have to sort of direct that um, in the city of Grand Rapids, and we are doing that, and we're pushing, and we're progressing, and we are, you know, will eventually be as progressive as Cascade Engineering, I hope, one day. And I think that we'll be there, and we're, and I think we're a leader in a lot of places, which is which is very exciting. So um, I'm really thankful to to be on the panel, and I'm thankful to to be the product of a lot of really great leadership in the university. So uh, thanks. Just a couple more thoughts, and then we're going to open up for lots of questions. Um, the question is, where is really uh, Grand Valley today? And one of the thoughts that just came out is, let me ask you all a question. Do you think there's a difference between green and sustainability, or do they both mean the same? Well, sustainability has been around forever. I think green is just a new way of phrasing it. And that's part of this issue of the definition of what does sustainability really mean. And the green aspect of it, people started using that, and there's a lot of what I call greenwashing going on right now. It's a great thing. It's a good thing. Because sustainability is going to have the certifications and the standards attached to it, and that's what you see with LEED standards. The furniture industry has a sustainable manufacturing standard. So sustainability with green, green is an aspect of it. But you have to get to this social and to this economic. Um, I spent yesterday with one of the interns working on a very interesting question. The question was, where does sustainability fit with capitalism? And that was just a, thank you for forwarding that to me, by the way, I appreciate that. Really good question. And one of the things that's jumped out now is this whole area of fiscal sustainability, a term we haven't used. However, if you go searching for it, you will find that our Government Accounting Standards Bureau, the GASB, now realizes they have to define it and it is being defined as we speak. So the accounting standards are now getting down to fiscal sustainability, which I think is a really interesting comment. So we now are on this journey, I, and I want to just uh, let you know the definitions have started to really form and really take some really good traction. Another thing that we've done here on campus is how do you fund sustainability? And we currently are not endowed, and that actually has been a good thing for us because the university has helped establish a reinvestment fund. And this is a reinvestment fund contributed by the project savings that we have seen. And now we have administration, that's, or the finance 
interesting enough, the finance department, which we all know is going through struggles wherever you are, has decided that they would help seed it. So we have our, our uh, bookstore, campus dining meeting, and student senate. So what we're doing is creating a fund for faculty and staff to do more project work, both on campus and the community. We've completed two sustainability indicator reports. And one of the things we learned when we did it the first time is it's really an assessment. And if you're gonna start sustainability anytime, anyplace, anywhere, you got to know where you are before you know where you're going. The good news is the university put some very big constraints on it, like use the very best practices you can find. Well, that took me a little while because I wasn't familiar with what those were. But they came from the Global Reporting Initiative, which is one of the few standards for sustainability accounting. So when you see accounting, and you look at the books, and you see standards, well, sustainability now from a reporting context globally is known as the Global Reporting Initiative. So they're standards. We happen to use that framework. So our second report just got issued. Three interesting, I'll just leave you with three interesting, just one metric from each area. Economic, Grand Valley provides $600 million of economic impact to the community every year. So one of the issues was if you're a business, you create cash and profit. How does the city of Grand Rapids and Grand Valley express economically what they do? And I'm seeing a shift in the desire to express things in economic impact because that takes the issue of your cost savings and your future benefit and starts describing value creation in the form of economic impact. That's one statistic. A second one is 15, roughly 15%, where's Steve Glass? I saw him here a minute ago. Steve, you did the original work. What's the percentage of students that actually are taking sustainability related courses at the 24,000 that we have? Uh, it's 13.9. 13.9, roughly 14% of all students, regardless of what college they're in, now receive sustainability as part of their curriculum. They're either exposed to it or are pursuing themes or certificates. That's, a, that's an important piece. And on the, on the other side, on the environmental side, we talked initially about the lead buildings, but Grand Valley will now have 12 of these, 12. The standards that I've seen our people and James Moyer set for lead buildings are bar none some of the toughest. And if he were here and had the mic and not me, he will tell you we can build those to competitive stick standards of the past. And that's a very interesting comment because you can capture those benefits. We have roughly 5 million square feet of buildings. 20% of it is now leading. And that's all happened in the last period of time. So this journey continues, but we've done these assessments. Sustainability is now embedded in the strategic plan for the university thanks to Wendy and a lot of hard work by others. But the most important thing for me is sustainability has now become the seventh value at the university. And when somebody puts a value to something, the level of expectations have just risen significantly. Because now, if you have a value, there's an expectation you're gonna live up to something. And when you live up to something, that comes along with, if President Haas was here, he would say relevance and stewardship and excellence and leadership. So those are the, the kinds of expectations that are now upon the work that we all do. So I just want to let you know that this journey for us continues. We're going to open it up for questions. Feel free to ask anything to anybody. I'm not sure we're going to have all the answers, but we'll try our best. But I just want to let you know we're making good progress, good traction, but each day is a new challenge. So questions, please. Anywhere. Yes, sir. I'm involved with the uh, Sustainability Committee in the City of Holland. I just want Grand Valley to know how much we appreciate Norm Christopher uh, came and spent an evening with us and lit us on fire. And we're still using his PowerPoint presentation to, uh, as we continue with sustainability. So thank you for making him available to us. So your influence goes beyond just Grand Valley and Grand Rapids, and I, I really appreciate that. I have a question about we're at a point now where we would like to identify certain stakeholders. You have this consortium of some 190 members in the city of Grand Rapids. And I'm just wondering, uh, how does that work on a continuing basis? Uh, when these people come together, are you looking for additional input from them? Are you looking for them to help to, to implement things that, that, uh, that you're thinking about? Just, 
how does it work on a continuing basis with this group that you've identified early on in your process? Well, first of all, it's great to see. Hi, Mark. How you doing? So we've got cities sitting by one another here now, which is a good thing as well. Um, it's a really good question that you ask. We actually have five of these partnerships now in West Michigan. So the original one was started by our mayor, but I have to tell you that if you go to Muskegon with the Muskegon Sustainability Coalition, they meet, as we know, monthly. Um, we have Holland Zealand, which I think is being reformed, and I actually see some very good work starting to come, but I know that the city needs to help continue to step up into the leadership to bring those stakeholders around because it's a natural affinity when a city comes to the table because the people in your area live in your city. So having you at the table as a stakeholder is extremely important. So we now have that initiative there. Spring Lake, the Spring Lake Grand Haven Group, um, Northwest Ottawa County, and we just recently um, have seen the initiative of the mayors of Battle Creek Portage and Kalamazoo come together under an interesting group called the Sustainability Covenant. Mm -hmm. So we have five of these in West Michigan, and the question is nobody pointed the finger at anybody and said, you need to have one of these. What we have found in these is, and it's very difficult to get your arms around because somebody said, well, where's your executive director for the CSP in Grand Rapids? Um, we don't have one. Well, where's your budget? Um, don't have one. I think it's really important that one of the other ways, because we all are in that kind of a mode every day, is where do we have the freedom to express conversation across public, private, academic, and service sectors? I see that as the real value. Um, I just came back from Quincy, Illinois, and they called and said, we need to start what you have. And it was, it brought a hundred stakeholders who hadn't really been connected and it was nothing more than getting them to the table in a very free and open format to ask what can we mutually do to hold each other accountable to make progress and that's how it all starts so I would encourage if you need some help in identifying who those are they're there and I think with not much effort you could establish something that would be very very meaningful to continue the journey and it's not necessarily a cost expense issue. It's more about what's in people's hearts, not what's in people's heads. Most of the work that I have seen in West Michigan, and I've always said when I first started with the mayor soon, and he and I will not agree on this point. And I remember being in uh, Portage when we uh, had the opportunity to share that. And I said, I do not see the political aspects of sustainability. I know the Democrats, I know the Republicans, I know the Tea Party, that doesn't matter. It's the question of what is the transparency, the mutual accountability, the integrity that we can all bring to make change. And that's what I've seen. And I know he's faced with political issues every day, but the ground roots, the grassroots of this initiative is not based upon the political advocacy. It's based upon the, these sets of guiding principles that apply to us all. So I just wanted to share that. I'm encouraging, and if you need some additional support, feel free. I know. We both, but thank you. Just um, one thing, and I think this was the CSB. Um, we had some summits, right? We had some summits where people people could come together. I think we had about four of them during a year, and we invited people to come and share best practices or share their initiative, you know, their ideas. And the first one was kind of hedgy, and people were talking. And I remember. We were at the what are we what is this you know what is sustainability but when we did the last one they asked people to map out the connections that they made about sustainability so we were each at a table and no one we were so we started writing our organizations and then mapping out the connections that we would made through these summits and the and then we put best practices and stuff and it was amazing the change just from getting people together to talk and then letting them go off and do their thing and make their own connections and so with the CSP kind of being the, the, the pulling together thing. The, really the only obligation is to uh, do a report yourselves and try to have, uh, try to share best practices, right? With the, so if you, if you could get the community to start connecting with each other, that's what really helped us, I think. I, Thank you. It's the, it's the same because Grand Rapids is basically, I mean, our uh, GBSU is really a city of 25,000. 
That's my mentality. It just happens to have facilities, administration, faculty, staff, and students, but we're still a community of 25,000. So that model had to be interdisciplinary and interconnected using a systems approach. Same thing for any community. So that's, but I, I have to say the big change that I've seen is the government has now formed through the EPA a sustainable communities group this year. I also have seen, because I'm on the email list, and how about this one, faith-based and neighborhood partnerships. So one of the issues now is sustainability is dropping from what I would refer to in their books written about this, the Stuart Hearts of Cornell, the top of the pyramid, but I see the sustainability going through the middle to the base of the pyramid because if it really does work, which I really believe it does, it works at the top of the pyramid, but it has to work for the marginalized as well. And that's the issue that we're at now. We have an initiative inside with the mayor now, who's very supportive of Seeds of Promise. This is an initiative around a public school, the Dickinson School. It's got 30 stakeholders in which we have chosen to come together, not driven by grants, not driven by um, any kind of funding at present. We're driven by the grassroots of asking an eight-year-old what they would like to see in life. When you do that, it's like when the president mentioned this morning about his two-year-old walking around with a daffodil. What an opportunity to ask an eight-year-old what they would like to see versus what we think they might need. So it's all based upon this issue of asking up front. And boy, some of the responses you get back are a little different than what you expect. So sustainability, I like the idea of it's penetrating, it's, it's moving its way through. You asked the question, where is Selma about before about the medium to small size businesses? They are now looking through case studies to get at it too. So it's, the traction is continuing, but it's a journey that's gonna take us a while. Next question. Yes, sir. Where's the junction between uh, sustainability and then the development side, especially with homeless population here in town? We see a lot of sustainability downtown here on campus. On South of Business Street, it doesn't look like there's much sustainability there. Um, and wanted to know where that social equity side plays into the, the nuts and bolts of this. So I don't know if that's Dean Grant or Mayor or some of the students as well. Um, yep. Yeah. So to your great Dean. I'll answer to you, but you want to respond as well. Well, just briefly, um, that, that someone who lives in the city of Grand Rapids, um, I can think of quite a few places where the city has been not only instrumental, but strategic and, and revitalizing certain areas so that we can introduce sustainable practices. Um, I mean, if you look at, at the whole East Hills District, I mean, you look at Marika Trees, all, all that stuff. I mean, that, that was a brownfield once upon a time, which is which is really cool. Those are those are places where industry has stepped up and decided that we will start this catalyst. And if you if you walk through that area, it's it's pretty remarkable because wealthy before before that investment was put in was you know considered kind of a, 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 a an interesting place to live, but now there's all there's so much diversity there, which is wonderful. And you know, me, my friends, we, we, we walk down there and you see all kind you see all kinds of walks of life that walk down wealthy now. And previously you didn't see that, which is really wonderful. And there are lots of areas in the city where that kind of where that kind of burgeoning stuff is happening. Um, it takes time. Um, I can tell you that there are um, right now in the community development part in the community development department department there is a program called the Neighborhood Stabilization Program where they are um, where they buy foreclosed homes um, well they the city doesn't ever own the home but we sell the home to a developer we put the seed money in to have the home redeveloped and this was a home that was previously a blighted a blighted property it was something that we weren't necessarily getting property tax from it was depressing home values around the area in this neighborhood um, and we're able to revitalize that area and in a lot of ways revitalize that home to lead certification so that not only do moderate to low income folks are they able to get into a home that one they can afford and it's financing that's agreeable, financing that's consistent, um, but it's a home that is that they're going to reap benefits from for, for decades because they've been able to get a house that has green principles built into it. Um, so I, I think that those areas are not only strategic, they're, they're happening and that they're happening in a at a, at a pretty micro level, and, and they're happening for people who really need it, which is which is great. And I don't I don't I don't know. I mean, I don't know how many of you knew about the neighborhood stabilization program before before I brought it up. But there are all kinds of programs, and there are all kinds of things that our city does 
that tries to ebb that that tries to ebb that that idea that somehow sustainability doesn't trickle down to our to our most marginalized population. We are working on it. And I know Dean Grant probably has some answers as well. Thank you. And I agree. I think what the what the mayor is doing and the, the city commissioners are trying to address some of those issues and identifying some of those areas. What we're trying to do with the with the city and some of the other programs, looking at this idea of of making decisions based on data, uh, doing the research, gathering the data. So one of the things that's happening is that there's a meeting, there's a meetings that, that we're having now, and there are like 60 different nonprofits in the in the community, and we're working out a way that we can share data, that we can have one place where all the data can be downloaded, and that then all of those folks will have access to it. And one of the projects we worked with was the mental health uh, funders. And they wanted to look at services they were providing, but where the clients were that were receiving those services, and they saw that there was a disconnect from where they thought the services should be and where the people were at, and they made a, a total change in the types of services that they were providing and where they were providing it. Also working with the, the churches, and so that using the churches uh, where they can say, we can identify the people in our church, in our community, and here are the needs that they have, and the agencies then can work with the churches to provide those uh, services. So those are the kinds of things that, are, that we're trying to do to meet that, the need. Not one person, not one agency, not one organization, but all of us sitting at the table together. And, to say, and as we continue to work out this way of uh, being able to share data, I think that you're also going to see this turn because of the services that can be provided and knowing that the resource is right next to you and you never knew that the resource was right next to you. One, one other thing that's happening is that one, one of our faculty is the co-chair of the Latino Coalition, which has brought together all the groups that service the Latino committee, community, and they are really working together. I think par partnerships are the most important thing now. We don't have a lot of resources and we really have to combine and pool what we have in the nonprofits as well as uh, with the profit, profit making organizations in the city. We just have got to understand what we're doing and get it all together. And that group is making a lot of progress in terms of pulling the service providers for that community together and making best uses of their of the bottom of the pyramid of services that they're trying to provide. Mayor, if I might just add one, one more thought to this or one other slant that I think I can be heard. Um, Five years ago, uh, Kent County and the city of Grand Rapids uh, uh, created something called the uh, Coalition to End Homelessness. That's a, uh, a, a collaborative now of about, uh, I think there are about 30 organizations uh, in, that, in that collaborative. We saw that the old way, through the collaborative, we saw that the old way of addressing homelessness was simply not working. It wasn't sustainable. Uh, and that is that you would say to someone when they became homeless, um, we'll, we'll fix you up. We'll bring all the services that you need together for health and mental health and uh, employment training and, and food resources. We'll fix you up so that you can be strong enough to, to, uh, to, to hang on to housing when we get you into housing. Um, the, the coalition said this isn't working. We've got to get people first into housing. And so they developed a model that's called Housing First. Uh, and it, and it, 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 has, it rehouses those who become homeless immediately, uh, or it assists those who are teetering on the edge and could fall into homelessness before they fall off the edge. Um, and then, once, once they have the relative security of housing, then you can load the services uh, and to, to give them a kind of assistance and support that, that, that they need. In the, in the short run, it's more costly. In the long run, it will be, it'll be far, far less costly because you don't have the recidivism that you have under the old model. If you, if you want to look at an interesting model, Denver has an interesting model where they, they put everybody that they could in housing. They figured out that it was costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars to provide just the health care for homeless people. And so they set up a place for them to live and a, and a set of services right in that housing that's really, that's really made a big difference. So, that Malcolm Gladwell uses that as one of his examples, but it's a good, it's, it's a good example. Yes. Uh, just a question on that database. Who's maintaining that database? Sierra did. Uh, 
Well, once we have it set up, the, the Johnson Center for Philanthropy will be the, the group that will maintain at the, the college. At the college. And, for, and the, the, for what area? Well, um, right now it's uh, for Kent County, but the, the plan is to ex expand that. Because right now we're doing data stuff for a couple of different uh, organizations in the city of Detroit, in Miami, in, in Ohio, and in discussion with uh, a couple of uh, groups in California. So once it's all set up, we can do it all over the country. But right now, the, the group uh, is in uh, Grand Rapids. It's, it's really fascinating to look at. You can go on their website and look it up. You can pick any part of the city, the neighborhood, and you can get all kinds of statistics and data to understand what the situation is in any neighborhood. You can look up your own or anybody else's, and you can figure out what the, what the issues are. It's really amazing. <laughs> it's a map. You know, you can just target a piece on the map. It's amazing. Uh, CRI data, www.cridata.org. And uh, it's amazing because you could go in as a resident of Grand Rapids and say, I wanted to run a profile just around a few blocks. You can do that. You, you can run the cursors and figure it out. So it takes the neighborhood associations, gets the profiles, and uh, I don't know how many pieces of data in there, but there's probably for each area. Uh, Hundreds. Yeah, hundreds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can demographically get the data that you need. So you might want to look at that. But that's a, a model that I think is going to be very important moving forward. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. First, thanks. Uh, thank you all for speaking today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, Mr. Christopher, you had mentioned earlier that 14% uh, of all Grand Valley students in over 200 courses were taking mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we're learning about sustainability in one way or another. My question is, how many, or what percentage of students at Grand Valley are enrolled in degree programs that lead directly to sustainable careers, be it in green jobs, mm -hmm. in social justice careers, etc.? And is there uh, a direct effort to recruit students for these degree programs? Uh, and if so, what measures are you taking? Sure, what's your next question? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this are all well thought out. Um, the answer to it is it's a journey as well. I wish I had all of that. Um, let me just give you a couple of quick points. Um, I'm not sure we, we do take exit interviews of the students on where they are going by college. That led to this $600 million of economic impact because we keep 80, 85% of the students in West Michigan. So if you run that base of the four or 5,000 that graduate every year, you, you can track some of that. About a year and a half ago, what was bothersome to me was the issue I could never find out any consolidated data of these jobs from the new economy. I just couldn't find it. I'd find a little report over here that said you might get wind turbine jobs here and you go to green jobs in Michigan, but the green jobs in Michigan only had five areas. They didn't have all of them. So I finally said to administration and ourselves is what role do we have in this? So we started this journey about classifying using Bureau of Labor Statistics, but they hadn't done anything in this area. I will short circuit my comment and tell you that if you look on the Bureau of Labor Statistics website today, they have just announced for the first time that they are going to database screen jobs. That's huge. Because one of the issues is you have every NAICS job that's already coded and you have a worker code in there, and if they don't match up, so our issue was, how do we get the green jobs if we can't match them the code? So we were trying, we were trying to do it by clean tech, and guess what? We weren't that far off from the work that we've had ongoing here for about six to nine months. So the jobs are coming through the clean tech avenue right now, but I'm pleased to say that if you go up there, now the only problem is they got $8 million, I think, to do the work, and our first report isn't due until 2012, and I think we probably have a few students that might like to know where they're going before then. So. Our administration will work in this area, but we're going to use this new format that we've just learned about, but we were on the journey, and hopefully that will now allow some future direction. However, as I said, it's primarily clean tech. It does not get necessarily to uh, Dean Grant's area and, and some of these other interdisciplinary areas, but uh, we're trying our best. But the other issue, too, is the shifting of the jobs isn't, it's what you call partial jobs in there, too, because um, I received a job at Grand Valley in this area after four years, so I didn't have a job coming in because they were so new here, they didn't even know what one was. So it took us a while to even define it. 
But now we have almost everyone taking a part of sustainability in their existing job. How do you classify that? So that's another issue, but we're looking at the, what I would call the, the full service jobs to, to begin with. Um, we, you can major in sustainability through the liberal studies program, and you can, your degree would say liberal studies with a sustainability emphasis. So, and that major is a create your own major. You can take courses from all across the university, you sit with an advisor and say, these are the areas I'm interested in, I want to pull together these courses. So right now that's, if you want to major in sustainability, that's how we're doing it. So it, people are majoring in sustainability and business or sustainability, you know, they connect things together. Uh, but we, we purposely have taken the route that we think that all our majors should be understand sustainable principles in relationship to their discipline and they should be able to apply those. So we're working on internships and other areas. We have, we have, we've had quite a few students who've been in internships and immediately have gotten a job because they come to the they come to the business or the nonprofit with sustainability information that that organization does not have, and they're able to um, you know they're able to help the organization and then become part of the sustainability project. Um, so that's basically that. But we're trying to infuse it across the whole curriculum. So if you're an engineer, if you're a history major, sociology, if you're doing social work or whatever you're doing. You understand what the sustainable principles are, principles are in relationship to your, to your job, you know, your career. That's what, where we are right now. So, yeah. um, I was just going to add to Dean Wonder's point that I definitely agree that I think too often sustainability becomes this, this thing that we make a. Uh, just yet another compartment or yet another discipline or yet another major. But I think what's really important is using sustainability as a framework to view everything. And I heard from someone once, I don't remember who, but that if you if you want a green job, you should make your job a green job rather than you know looking for these specific jobs that are considered green jobs. Like I, I'm an MPA student, which wouldn't necessarily fall into the sector of what you'd call a green job, but I definitely view what I'm learning as sustainability and I'm not going to be working for a wind turbine manufacturing company but I, I want my job after I graduate to be in sustainability whether or not it's something that's going to be cataloged as a green job. I just wanted to say this green jobs databases I'm, I'm doing the work with students but we're doing it for our career services because they're the one where the questions come as we post jobs. So that's the administration's desire is to have this stuff through career services. So this is not a separate piece of work. It's going to be done all for them and framed for them. And they have a number of businesses here as well as organizations and we're now posting these kinds of jobs. They're starting to come. So, uh, any other questions? Yes, ma'am? changing experience there to, to see the students in this beautiful building. So we're going to try to bring our very best to it, but I agree with you. Thanks, and uh, maybe we can chat afterwards here. Other questions? Well, on behalf of myself and everybody up here, thanks. I uh, appreciate it, and uh, we're going to stay the course. The preceding program is copyrighted by Grand Valley State University. Visit us at gvsu.edu.